Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditations and all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So Dwight and I have, um, have been married now for 10 years. And, you know, in 10 years you learn a lot about a person. But I think you learn the most like that first year of marriage when you have to get used to all the things the other person does that annoy you. And I've, t- I've told some of you before that Dwight is a really, really picky eater, like super picky. And our first year of marriage, one of the major fights we had was over bread. Because Dwight grew up eating white bread, like the kind that you could squish and it would stay squished in the little, you know. And I grew up eating wheat bread, which had lots of nutritious, nutritious things and, you know, stuff on the crust. And... Uh, And so when I brought home wheat bread, Dwight refused to eat it because you couldn't squish it and have it stay in the same form. (laughs) So then, you know, you could always tell who had gone to the grocery store by what kind of bread we had on the counter. If Dwight went, we had white bread, and if I went, we had wheat bread. So then we tried just buying both, but that was a waste of bread because we never finished both of them. Uh, So then we finally uh, compromised, and now we buy honey wheat bread, which isn't really wheat bread, but it's also not really white bread. So now, no matter which one of us goes to the store, we buy honey wheat bread. So, this morning we um, come to John chapter 6, that is a a whole chapter about being fed by God. And I just want to give you a little bit of um, geography about the chapter, because we come in right at the end of chapter 6. So this is a a map of the Sea of Galilee. At the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus is in Tabgah, where he feeds the 5,000. I should have... um, I should have gotten the pointer, but I forgot to do it. So you see, um, oh, thank you, uh, Barry. So up on the left side, up at the top, you see Capernaum, which is over to the right a little bit. Yep, right there. That's Capernaum. Now right to the left, the first... (laughs) We should have practiced. The first dot to the left of Capernaum is called Tabgah. And that's where um, Jesus feeds the 5,000. So that's where we start out at the beginning of chapter 6. And then it tells us that the disciples, uh, Jesus left because the crowd was too large, and so he goes up to the mountain to be alone. And while he's gone, the disciples get in a boat, and they go across the water. And while they're maybe two or three uh, miles out, Jesus comes to them walking on the water, uh, calms the storm because they're all freaked out, and then gets in the boat, and they go on to Capernaum, which is the first little dot where Barry is right now, Capernaum. The next day, scripture tells us, the people are on the other side of the sea, and they notice just one boat was missing, which means they knew that Jesus hadn't gotten in a boat to go away, but knew the disciples had gone. And they start looking for him. They see that there are boats coming from Tiberias, which is right down here, the first, yep, right there. That's Tiberias. So they see boats going from Tiberias to Capernaum, and so the crowd that he had fed at, uh, at Tabga gets in boats and go up to Capernaum, which you can see isn't very far. The two dots up on the top left is not very far from one another. So that's where we find ourselves. Jesus is literally being chased by the crowds that he'd fed at Tabga. They are following him even across the sea. As soon as they realized that he had changed locations, they were after him. So hungry were they for his teaching and healing. So when they finally find him in Capernaum, they come to him and say, Rabbi, when did you come here? In his response, Jesus uh, insists that they are looking for him not because of the miracles he has performed, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. I've always wondered what Jesus was saying there. Is he implying that they only want him because he might give them something to meet their immediate needs? Or is he, or sa- is he saying that they are coming to him not just because of the miracles he does, just surface acts that indicate something more about who Jesus is, but because they had their deeper needs met? Even in the feeding of the 5,000, they somehow were filled in a way that they wanted to happen again. Jesus tells them then to seek not that which perishes, simple bread, but that which endures, the kind of food that will leave you never hungering again, the kind of water which will clench your thirst always. But the people, the crowds whom he's talking to, don't get it. 
They still want to see signs. They want the bread from heaven as their ancestors received manna from heaven when they were lost in the wilderness. So Jesus states things even more clearly for them. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Now, I think in some ways, um, the imagery of bread doesn't connect as much for us today as it did in Jesus' time, because today we have so many food options that bread has become in some ways just an afterthought, right? It's an extra thing to cover our sandwich fillings or something to coat other more interesting foods with, or sometimes it's just an appetizer before the main meal, like when they serve you bread at Outback or Red Lobster, right? It's just an appetizer. Or it's something we give up. We give up bread to give up the carbs to save ourselves a few calories. But in Jesus' day, and for hundreds of years, bread was essential. It was often a meal in itself, all you would eat. So when Jesus compares himself to the bread of life, he's saying that he is essential, that he is our sustenance. He is our daily bread, part of our normal, everyday diet, a meal that fills us in and of itself. He isn't a special treat or an occasional snack, or as one pastor writes, he's not finger food for a cocktail party. He's our day in and day out food for survival. But I wonder how often we treat Jesus like the appetizer before the main meal. Or more importantly, how often we treat Jesus like he's something that we can give up on one day and take up the next, instead of acting like he is the very thing we need for survival. As one pastor put it to me this week, are we guilty of looking for miracles or of chasing the abundance represented by the fishes and loaves? Are we curiosity seekers hoping to be present when the latest novelty becomes public? In the conversation with the crowd, Jesus says to them very clearly, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who drinks of me shall never thirst. Now the folks who were with him were still thinking physically, right? Because they were connecting what he said with the meal that they just had, with the food that he'd just given them, and with the manna that their ancestors received. But Jesus isn't talking to them about their next meal. He's talking about a kind of sustenance that gets us through the days when it feels like our burdens will overwhelm us. The days where the world's problems, where our own personal issues seem like mountains before us. On those days, he says, we will never be hungry because we will have the bread of life to sustain us through the hard trek up the mountain. Today we celebrate Holy Communion together. We gather together for a meal of what is truly essential, the bread of life given for us, shared with us by God's own child. When we come to this meal together, we do more than participate in a ritual and say a few words. We open ourselves to receiving God's grace. We open ourselves to being linked in to that which gives our life its meaning and purpose. It cannot be an afterthought or an appetizer. So think for a minute. Why are you here? Is it because you are hungry for the bread of life? Because you want to drink from the water of life? Because friends, we don't need to look elsewhere. Jesus tells us, I am the bread of life. With the bread of life, God's grace and love will be with us always, every day, on every mountain we have to climb, and we will never be hungry again. Let us come to God's table and eat our fill. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.